Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session, The View From Here, Minnesota Media After the National Spotlight. My name is Rocio Ortega. I am the Events Associate at ProPublica, and I'll be your host today. We'll get started in just a few moments. We're just waiting for a few more people to sign on. Thank you so much for your patience. Closed captioning of the program is available today and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. Today, ProPublica journalist Jessica Lusenhop will moderate a, moderate a conversation with a group of dynamic media leaders in Minnesota about representation, resources, and what it means to create trusted and meaningful media. And it looks like we have enough folks on now, so let's go ahead and get started. If you're just joining, my name is Rocio Ortega, and I'm ProPublica's events associate. Welcome to today's session, The View From Here, Minnesota, Minnesota Media After the National Spotlight. Thank you to McKinsey and Company for their support of today's event. The event is being held in partnership with Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Closed captioning of the program is available and can be enabled by clicking on the closed caption option on the bar towards the bottom of your screen. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. Today, we'll be speaking with dynamic media leaders in Minnesota about how local outlets continue to innovate with an eye on providing news that empowers a local community and champions underrepresented voices. I'd now like to invite our panelists to go ahead and join us on screen. You can go ahead and turn on your cameras. Thank you so much for being here today. Just for some quick introductions, Harry Colbert Jr. is an award-winning journalist and columnist. He is a managing editor of Min Post. Suki Dardarian is the incoming editor and senior vice president of Star Tribune, having served as senior managing editor and vice president for the last eight years. Their publication was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in breaking news last year for the coverage of the killing of George Floyd and the aftermath. Sarah Glover is a managing editor of Minnesota Public Radio and leads a team of more than 40 reporters, photojournalists, and editors. She is responsible for editorial decisions and planning across NPR news platforms. Mukhtar Ibrahim is the founder of Sahan Journal, a nonprofit news organization that covers Minnesota's immigrants and communities of color. He previously worked as a reporter for the Star Tribune and Minnesota Public Radio News. Tracy Williams Dillard is a CEO and publisher of the Minnesota Spokesman Reporter, the oldest black owned newspaper in the state of Minnesota and one of the longest standing family owned newspapers in the country. Our moderator today is ProPublica journalist, Jessica Lissenhop. Jessica is a part of our Midwest newsroom and is covering issues in Minnesota. As an additional note, the session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed to everyone who registered. Thank you all so much again for being here today, and I hope you enjoy the session and this conversation. I'll go ahead and let Jessica take it from here. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Jessica Lessenhoff. Uh, like Rosia said, I am a reporter for ProPublica. Um, my new beat is covering the state of Minnesota, and I'm super thrilled to have uh, all of our panelists here and everyone watching uh, live and on the recording. So thank you guys all for being here. Um, I am going to just jump right in if that's all right. Um, kind of want to throw out something to the whole panel see, you know, if a couple different people want to weigh in here. I had a chance to chat with um, some of the panelists ahead of time, and I thought one of the interesting things that multiple people brought up, sort of one of the more interesting things happening in our, our, media, eco, our media ecosystem here uh, is partnerships, the idea of doing more partnerships, whether that's partnerships with one another here locally, um, partnerships that came out of, you know, having so much national and even international outlets in town over the last several years. Um, when it makes sense to do those partnerships, when it works, when it doesn't. Um, and I kind of want to throw that out to the group. I might ask uh, Harry, if you don't mind, if you want to kind of take it first and see where it goes from there. Thank you. And thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this dynamic panel. It really is an honor. Well, when everything happened with the killing of George Floyd and then later the killing of Dante Wright, I wasn't even at Ben Post. I was at a smaller outlet, North News, which is um, demographically focused in North Minneapolis. 
killing of George Floyd didn't even happen in North Minneapolis. It happened in South Minneapolis, but we recognized immediately the uh, vibration that it was going to have across our city and, and region. I, I don't necessarily know that we recognized what it was going to have nationally and internationally, but we knew at that time we had to be a part of this. Um, and when it came to the coverage, um, and, it, and it's funny because I was talking to someone just a couple of days ago, and we were talking about what was happening in the aftermath of the killing with um, buildings being burned, looted, and things of that nature in North Minneapolis. Uh, this person who wasn't from Minneapolis was saying, well, we never heard that. We didn't get that on the national. We thought it was confined to just a couple of blocks. And I'm like, no, the for really the entire city was on fire uh, when you look back at things. But what I remember about that is as local journalists, a lot of times we felt like somehow we were outsiders in our own city. Um, the national media um, came in and, and it's not to discredit what they do because they have a very specific task, but the national media came in and um, we called it drive-by journalism, where they came in, they reported on the story, they descended on the town for a minute, and then they were gone. And we were we as local media were left to kind of complete the story, but and also deal with the fact that this is our home. Uh, outside of being our business, we had to deal with this as real life human beings. And so, um, one of the things that I uh, would have liked a lot more. Uh, would have been national organizations reaching out, coming in, partnering with some of the uh, local media that had understanding of why George Floyd was George Floyd. And that's saying we had pre-incidents. We had Orlando Castile. We had uh, Jamar Clark. We had so many other things that led up to um, the aftermath of the killing, the murder of George Floyd that national media, I don't necessarily was able to digest and they would have been able to digest it better had they been talking and partnering with local media. Yeah, and can I actually, I might kick it to Suki from there because um, she mentioned sort of, I, th I think, yeah, that is a struggle for local journalists when we feel like we're, you know, there's just parachuting journalists um, and uh, and we don't really feel like our expertise is, is respected or perspective is respected. But Suki told me a pretty interesting story about how um, national, but also local outlets were able to come together, particularly around the trial of Derek Chauvin. Suki, do you mind telling that story about how there was sort sure. of a productive brigade created, I think you called it? Yeah, I, I do. I do think Harry's point is well taken. And, and I think, I think there was kind of a moment for us where, you know, we were living the story and covering the story. And yet there was all this national coverage and um, we were all trying to get our heads around what our audience needed and also to help the people in our newsrooms and in our community. And so I think we saw journalists on the street helping each other, giving each other rides, covering protests together. Um, it, it did feel like it was a, mo a moment of change for a lot of reasons. Um, but as as things progressed, and there you know was a criminal process against Derek Chauvin, um, that became a huge concern for everybody. How are we going to cover that? How can we own that for our audience when there's so much national focus? And we had a trial in a previous police shooting um, where the judge and and just since COVID broke out, where the judge was extremely restrictive around evidence, around access to the courtroom, around um, juror information, made very negative statements about the media and our prurient interest in the case. And um, it, was, it was a frightening, frightening trial to cover. And we battled hard to get access. So when, when we saw this case coming into the same court, um, we were lucky to have a new chief judge um, who uh, was very committed to transparency in the in the case and who partnered, who reached out and we reached out to 
the court and started a series of conversations with local media. And then we added in national media to talk about how we could cover this, how the, how the public could have access to this trial. Um, you know, and we did have to file a few motions uh, to, to support, uh, to kill gag orders and get evidence and, and that sort of thing. But in the end, um, we all partnered in covering that. We had a, a pool process. Everybody on this call was, was part of that. Um, and uh, we all joined in the legal efforts uh, and filed, you know, it was a joint motion. And it was a, it was, it was a, I think a defining moment for us to come together and lead the way. And, you know, as we all know, it was kind of the trial of the century. And, you know, for, for Minnesota, which has super restrictive access to photos in the courtroom, to have a live stream trial, globally live streamed, was, was incredible. And, you know, I credit the media here uh, coming together and showing united force for open government getting that going. Yeah, I'm pretty fascinated by the idea of it's a, that being a partnership, not just in terms of coverage, but a, you know, a partnership legally, um, sort of the media legally sort of presenting kind of a united front for access. I, I just think that's really interesting. Um, you know, obviously this past couple of years have been, you know, have changed a lot of things here locally in all of our newsrooms. I was wondering if I could ask Tracy, a little bit about how um, the last few years have been for your newsroom, for your reporters. I mean, we're not only talking about the murder of George Floyd and, and the aftermath of all the trials and everything like that, but COVID, which I know um, the spokesman reporter lost Mel Reeves recently, um, and he was such a big part of that newsroom. But at the same time, I also know that, you know, this kind of this time period also probably, I would guess, introduced a whole new generation to the spokesman reporter and to the work of your reporter. So I'm curious how, at this point, looking forward, um, what does the future of the Minnesota spokesman reporter look for you? Oh, Tracy, I think you're muted. Unmute myself. Okay, there we go. Um, I just want to first, you know, say hello and thank you for uh, inviting me on the show this evening and uh, to thank you for all my esteemed panelists and joining. It's um, exciting to, to be on the panel with everyone. Um, yes, we unfortunately um, were six blocks away from the whole George Floyd incident. So we were right here in the midst of it, you know, not just Minnesota being the epicenter, but the paper in itself being right here. Um, so it was, it was definitely a different time, still is. It's still very much is in terms of the George Floyd corner and some of the activities that are still taking place in the neighborhood itself. Um, certainly, uh, you know, when, when Mel first came on, we were excited to have him back because he had been with us for a period of time. And then he left for quite a period of time, just happened to come back right at the time when so much is going on with police brutality, you know, even long before George Floyd, it, it, George Floyd took the, the national stage, the world stage, um, but certainly a lot of cases that Mel wrote about long before that, um, and then losing Mel to a pandemic, and it was just strange how that even happened, because one day I'm sending him his favorite soup, and <laughs> And the next day I get the call. So it was it was different. And, and I lost my husband to the same cause, unfortunately, almost a year from losing mail. So it's another repeat to to the paper in itself and then and trying to continue the coverage of the pandemic as we've been writing several stories about that, trying to continue to inform and engage our community on safety protocols they need to take in order to to save themselves and to save their loved ones by doing the things that it takes to be safe. So what our newsroom looks like moving forward is we've actually mail, one of the things that we have a lot of the remnants from mail, because while he was out doing the work he was doing, he ran into a lot of young journalists, not all African-Americans that definitely understand the struggle 
and are definitely interested in being a part of the stories that we have to tell. Uh, a lot of our stories aren't stories that we want to tell. Um, I would like to not tell a lot of them that we have to tell. But if we don't tell them, they won't get told or they won't get told correctly or they won't get told in the voices that need to be the way they need to be told. Because you can tell one story one way. And you can tell that same story another. And I'll give you an example of one of a, one of my colleagues that was with a radio station years ago. And we had lunch one day and he's like, you know, Tracy, I get your paper and then I get a daily. And he goes, and the stories are the same story, talking about the same incident, completely different when I read them. I get the, I get the inside view of it from an African American perspective which is completely a different view than I get from the mainstream perspective. So with our news room, we have to continue to write the news that's impacting our communities in a way that they understand how it affects them every day and, and not necessarily what they're gonna read or see other places. And, and so for us to, A, number one, I always say that, that we got all of our social media channels, we got all these different outlets now people can get their news. But one thing that is true to when it started years ago with the internet and how it is yet maintaining today, when people are looking for news from an African-American perspective, not watered down by the powers that be, because when I have writers and editors, they are mostly African-American themselves and they get that perspective. It kind of, the voice stays the same. So our motto is, as it was spoken, let us record. So if you submit a story as a writer, once you've been assigned, we don't change the voices unless they don't sound like the voice of our community. Well, that's really powerful. Thanks for that. And, and I guess I would actually then turn to Mukhtar who um, runs one of the younger newsrooms uh, here in our, again, our little Minnesota ecosystem here. But even you were, we were talking a little bit about how your vision for Sahan Journal has, you know, continued to evolve, particularly in the last couple of years. And I'm curious, yeah, could you just talk a little bit about sort of where you see the mission expanding and evolving from where you started? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, we launched Sahan Journal in the summer of 2019, just a few months before the world changed and the pandemic arrived. And a couple of months before George Floyd was killed, um, I launched, you know, it was just me when I launched Sahan Journal with no reporters uh, or editors or anything. And the idea was to cover uh, immigrants and, and refugee communities. Um, that's something that was close to my heart when I was beginning um, this project. And that's something I knew very well. Um, so I, I did that in the first couple of months doing uh, reporting on my own freelancing and also using contributing reporters and the idea was just to prove the concept of, of the mission, right? Trying to really bring the stories that um, have complexity, have uh, depth and uh, very unique and rich that no one else was doing. And um, I started fundraising, talking to local foundations and supporters. And when we got enough funding, um, the, you know, the world changed and that really made our mission more uh, relevant and critical. We started um, translating stories into multiple languages, Somali, Hmong, and Spanish, so that um, people who cannot get their information in English, uh, directives from local agencies or the federal government can get more information in their native languages so that we can at least tell people how things have been rapidly changing around coronavirus and the measurements that uh, um, were coming down. And then we, we found that was really time consuming, um, translating st uh, stories and articles in multiple languages as information was changing very fast. Um, we were working with nine constructors and editing you know, all those uh, translated material. And it, it was really time consuming, very expensive. And uh, we realized that was not sustainable. So we kind of made a pivot and um, in, in like 2021, for example, we made um, our material in a very accessible way 
multimedia format. So we're talking about uh, coronavirus, you know, the vaccine, how um, that has been changing, the rumors that we have been getting from the community. And, you know, we partnered with uh, very trusted community figures in, in the Latino community, in the Somali community, and in the Hmong community, so that we can at least, you know, inform them about the vaccine and how they can benefit from the information that we're providing. And then, you know, back um, a couple of months before that, when George Ford was killed, we were out in the streets, and that was when we were just building the project, right? We have now reporters, we have some capacity to do more stories, and George Floyd was killed, and then we were out in the streets, and we found this confluence of events of people, different communities coming together, joining hands, you know, trying to seek justice, and um, some people even identifying themselves, not necessarily as immigrants, but, you know, as a person of color, I'm talking about, you know, people who have been here for generations. Uh, for example, the Hmong community has been here for almost 40 years, and the younger generations do not necessarily identify themselves as, you know, immigrants and or refugees. Um, and also we, we try to provide um, and connect with, you know, the African-American community since that is something that, you know, was uh, very important to them. And we found that we should at least, you know, expand our mission to include more of communities of color and not just focus ourselves in like just covering immigrants and refugees, which is kind of fluid and change, right? Um, so that really made, you know, we, we made a transition of trying to expand our mission to include more coverage for uh, all BIPOC communities. And we found that, you know, was very meaningful and uh, really elevated our mission and our coverage. When, you know, the trial happened, for example, we invited community members uh, to just, you know, talk to each other and talk about what justice might look like for the community. We are not, you know, covering the daily updates about the trial. We have, at that time, we had a partnership with NPR. So we were cross-posting the updates about the trial and what was going on in the court. And in addition, we tried to provide more meaningful coverage by giving the voice to the community and saying, you know, tell us your story. How do you see what's going on? How do you see, um, what do you see justice might look like? How racism is making people sick? and trying to engage the community with, with the process of um, the editorial production of our work and not necessarily us coming and telling these stories. We, we ask them to tell the story from their perspective. Since this was a big issue that everyone was you know, paying attention and um, you know, we also you know, transcribed the conversations and we had you know, 5,000 word story of Q and A's and people were reading those stories and spending, you know, 10, 15 minutes on those stories. And, and um, that was really incredible to see the lot, that level of interest from, from readers. And that's how we shifted our mission from just being covering immigrants and refugees to making the mission more relevant to all communities of color who are now making, you know, a sizable number of states population. I, I have to say, I find it minorly mind blowing to hear that Sahan Journal has been around since 2019. I feel like it looms very large in my mind. It, it punches well above its weight. And I'm 2019. I feel like you guys have been around forever. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, Sarah, if I can turn to you, I'm, I'm curious, you know, in your role at NPR, sort of, I wanted to hear a little bit about how you sort of try to be intentional and steer NPR towards um, covering some of those underserved communities and what your sort of strategy is in such a large statewide bureau. You know, do you do that in the, um, you know, the people you hire, the coverage that you encourage? Like, what can you talk a little bit about sort of those, those uh, higher level decisions that, that you're a part of that, that help serve those communities better? Thanks, Jessica, for the question. And also excited to be on this panel. Nice to see everyone uh, virtually. And thanks for people who are tuning in. I'm a, I appreciate being a part of the discussion. And I really wanted to bumper my comments with that I'm still very much a newbie. I've been um, at NPR News since last April and would just like to shout out and give all the praise to the staff at NPR News. Um, they've done all the heavy lifting and continue to do it. It's a mighty 
team that's very steeped in the dedication of the mission of the organization and being a public media company as well, I think kind of has a very strong overtone in terms of how the teams approach coverage. And there's this sense of responsibility and intention that goes into the news gathering every day. So I am just honored to be a part of the team and certainly here to help shepherd. But I wanna just say that, there, that we are so many talented people that are doing and have been doing the work um, across the board, and we have a, a terrific race class and communities team. Um, we have uh, folks that um, are just, you know, rising to the occasion day after day, and really trying to find opportunities to, to add nuance and go deeper into particular storylines. And I think right now, um, to answer your question with specificity, one of the highlights of uh, one of the strategies in the newsroom is a current project that we're undertaking called the North Star Journey. And so I will at some point here put it in the chat and folks are welcome to Google it. Um, but in short, it's nprnews.org uh, and then um, slash North Star Journey. Um, and what this is, is it is a, um, I'm happy to talk about it today because it's something that um, you'll probably hear more about externally, but it's a focal point for NPR News to be as intentional as possible in its coverage of diverse communities around the state of Minnesota. So interestingly, a star has five points and this um, first iteration of this project will be a five month journey. So it's, it launched March 14th and the, the news leaders here, um, I think might appreciate what I called it to be a soft launch. Um, and that means that um, you don't put all your, your kind of your focal point or your eggs in the basket of the day that it starts, but that you recognize that, um, that it is in fact um, a, a narrative process or a project that would have an arc, like a story arc. So we're ramping up to this um, really good project and opportunity to tell um, a barrage of stories across the state. And we're able to parlay then our teams on different um, desks, you know, on different teams. And one of our teams is obviously the regional team, which we have, um, you know, a deputy managing editor and Lorna Benson. We have um, our newly appointed editor of that team, which is UN Kerr. And we have a barrage of reporters across the state. And our newest reporter is Matthew Holden Eagle III, who's based in Bemidji. And I'm sure you know some of the stalwart names of Dan Gunderson, Dan Crocker, um, Hannah Yang, and Catherine Richard and Kirstie Maroney. Um, but that collective uh, work of that, of that group is bringing such nuance to this effort of really telling um, stories that, that will be ingrained kind of hopefully in the minds of folks because we were looking for those untold stories. Um, I also um, wanted to say that one of the elements of just coming to um, this conversation as a news leader is that we have to do more to putting action steps into practice in terms of um, moving beyond talking about what the problems are in the industry. And um, I'm, I think, coming to this role with that kind of purview of having worked um, in another part of the country. And so I have perspective that I really appreciated um, that Harry spoke to in the beginning, the shortcomings of the national media. And I certainly um, agree with that. And, and now that I'm here and working here, I really work really hard to make sure that I'm being um, respectful of not just perspective, but the fact that we have to um, do more to amplify the really terrific journalism across the state of Minnesota. And so this panel, um, I feel like I'm just not worthy to be on it because you guys are, you're the stars, you're the persons who've been doing this work and there should be more beating of the drum and more um, praise of the people who've been doing, who've been here and been doing this work. Um, I wanted to finish my comment, Jessica, with kind of answering your first question around partnership. And that is that um, I kind of extend and reach out to all of the fellow panelists, I hope to have a personal call with you individually about how we can partner on this North Star journey and maybe do some collective journalism. Because to me, I think that's really the next level of our field is, is really rooting um, our shared kind of um, editorial expertise and finding some you know, glimmers of opportunities, even if it's once a year or twice a year, that we can come together and collaborate and, and celebrate each other. I think it's good for the audiences um, and it's good for each other. If there's things that we can um, help you with and, and Sahan, um, you know, out of all of you, they have a very um, special place in our heart at NPR News because we help 
launched the Han and um, Mukhtar was on staff here. Um, and also, you know, we continue to support you all today and look forward to continued work together. But um, I'm here today to really sing your praises and I appreciate you all, whether, although I have not met you all personally. Um, and I also want to again, amplify the NPR news staff and just the tremendous work that they do. And I consider it against all odds, right? Because I'm sure the folks on the call agree, we all need more resources. We all need more people on our teams to do this very important and engaged um, work that we um, put forth to do every day. Um, and so our staffs are really the, the the persons that are making it happen um, day over day. So I just wanted to, to thank them for their effort and their hard work each day. I'd like to say yeah. amen to that. <laughs> I, I, I'll just, one, one brief observation that, that the, the, the readers and audience, media audience in Minnesota is extremely lucky. The media ecosystem, the news ecosystem here is rich and diverse as you, as you can well see um it is it is a generous community in terms of its time and its and its money for the media we are one of the of we are one of the highest subscription news papers in the country and this is the state that has the highest voter turnout I think we all experienced uh, a lot more engagement with our with our work um, in the past few years, and that's a that's a reflection of the great commitment that this that so many people in this community have to civic life. And um, some of us partnered on polling before the last election, and that content was just devoured. And I think I think. The people of Minnesota are very lucky. They're also very smart and they're very demanding and discerning. And they, they, I think, appreciate all of what's going on in this ecosystem. So commercial over. Yeah, I think that um, it's been, yeah, it's been really exciting to think about um, how we can all partner uh, together, I think ProPublica, of course, wants to be part of partnerships as well. I, I, because there was a time when, of course, we would just all be strictly competitors, um, and that doesn't uh, that doesn't seem to be the way the way to you know. Then we'd all just be working harder, not smarter. So, um, so yeah, it's exciting to hear that everybody else is is down for that same journey. Um, and then I guess since Sarah, you know, you mentioned that you're you feel still new in your job. I mean, there's I guess a few of us here that are new in our jobs and. Um, Harry, I'm curious if you, you'd be willing to talk a little bit about sort of where your, you know, MinPost has, has new leadership and I'm curious where you're hoping, where, where you're hoping to steer coverage, where, if there are specific areas that you want to divert more of MinPost resources to, or, if, you know, if, if, you know, the way to better serve your audience is in the, you know, education arena, um, healthcare, you know, um, environment, public safety, sort of where, where are your sort of, uh, what sort of are the, the stars that are guiding you at this point? Well, uh, first, and I uh, also want to echo what uh, Suki said, because we look at this panel that we have, and I moved to Minnesota in 2008. And before I moved here, there was a perception of Minnesota, and that perception was uh, a very white northern state. And we look at this panel, and we see the extreme uh, diversity that is not only here, but that is valued. And so that's been something that's been really eye-opening to see. And I hope the national audience will recognize the diversity that uh, lives within our state. And we actually have a star, Sarah, who comes to Minnesota, um, not only as a great journalist, but she was our past president of the National Association of Black Journalists and um, led that organization masterfully. So we appreciate that. I'm like three months in, I'm three months into MidPost. And um, I recognize that I'm here because of my talent, absolutely. But I also recognize that I'm here because I'm a diverse voice and I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. Um, for a long time, um, there has been a perception and men post that it didn't have a diverse um, leadership nor uh, readership. What we're gonna do is um, 
and and it's a and it's a balancing act because we have a very loyal and very well read and educated uh, readership at MinPost. We don't want to alienate that audience, but we absolutely have to grow it, and that's just the reality of the uh, the matter. Uh, the demographics of Minnesota are changing, therefore we have to make sure that we change with those demographics. I remember years ago when um, I was still in college and we did a program at, um, I was at Mizzou and we did a program in Kansas City and we were with the Kansas City Star. And this was back in the 1990s. And what they found at the Kansas City Star was the newspaper itself had alienated the black boys so much so that people didn't trust it, didn't read it. And this Kansas City Star was basically saying, with the changing demographics of that city, they wouldn't survive if they are not being consumed by the changing demographic. We have to too recognize that we have a change in demographic and we wanna make sure that we are offering news and views that are reflecting uh, that demographic. So, so that's kind of the direction that we'll be looking at at MinPost. And once again, it's, as I said earlier, it is a balancing act because we can't alienate what, uh, uh, as they say, dance who brought you to, to the party. So we can't alienate the audience that we have, but we certainly have to grow it. Um, yeah, I think that the, actually I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask Tracy something that about uh, uh, an interview I saw, I mean, kind of off of back of what Harry was just saying. Um, I read an interview that Tracy did a, a while ago talking about how sometimes when, um, and you talked about it a little bit in your uh, response previously, like sort of when you read the coverage from, um, from spokesman the reporter and compare it to some of the coverage in other outlets that sort of reporting on um, what was happening in the, in the African American community felt like it was reported at sort of a, a remove, um, whereas sort of your staff, your editors, your reporters are, I think you said you're, but you're actually living it. It's your daily life. And, and I guess I was curious if, you know, over the years or if even maybe just recently, have you noticed that, you know, more, more writers of color, more, more voices of color are sort of breaking through and there's less of that, that gap or, I don't know, do you think things are changing? Tracy, I think you're on mute again, I'm sorry. So far, okay. So I think Harry had mentioned it just briefly a little bit ago, and it you know it's also kind of what what we talk about a lot here at the MSR when it does come to other media's covering communities of color, more specifically African American news, and it it, it it's more like a drive by journalism. So it's 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 it, they may touch on it because it's like okay we got to make sure that we're inclusive to everyone now we're inclusive to all communities. But the problem that exists is it doesn't, it, they, it, they don't drill down, it's, it's surface. It's just like when they came in for the George Floyd, it was news. Oh, so let's, let's all jump in and let's all get the news of the day. But what we do, what I don't see a lot of is, okay, now the smoke is clear. What is the community talking about now? You know, how can, and, and the, there's some, a lot of just lack of trust. So a lot of times, other medias can't come in and really talk to the guy on the corner that just happens to walk by my building because they don't trust the other medias to tell their story correctly. So, so they, it's a part of that, but it's also just not seeing that there's that much concern that I see in other medias where I, I don't fail to see anything negative. If there's a shooting over North, I, I certainly can pretty much see that get covered. But what about some of the positive things that are going on in our community that I don't see any of that in a lot of the other medias, you know, and even when I see a George Floyd or all the other cases that have come to front, I see this the surface that I would probably see on the on the national news. But from the local perspective, I don't see a big change in answer to your question in terms of what that looks like. And I think until we see more people that are brought in like Harry, where they're really serious about and committed to, and not just according to the Colonel Commission, where they talked about 
bringing you know, back in 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 uh, 1967, where they talked about bringing the need to bring more communities of color or into the newsroom, the bring more reporters. But what the problem exists then and still today, a lot of the reporters only can do what the editors send them out to do. So there's still somewhat of a gag there from our perspective here, where we're looking at, you know, we got the black community that we're writing about and we're writing about it from the black perspective. So we're not, not sugarcoating stuff. Or we're not, not writing it because we gotta be careful about how we say it or what we say it so we just don't say it. And I think that's a lot too that plays into the coverage that may or may not happen. Um, so answer to your question, I don't see a lot of deep diving stories where um, it pertains to the African-American community and the Black community where it could with deeper writing, less, uh, less of surface reporting, less of let's be like the national news, let's get the news and let's move on to something different. But how can we really keep that story alive and really tell it where it's going to make a difference? Yeah, and I think another thing I'm really curious about is, um, and I'm sure any of you guys could answer this, but how there's a lot of emphasis on trying to diversify the newsroom. And I'm interested in, um, you know, what thoughts do people have about not just making those hires, but retaining those reporters? Um, want, making them want to stay on to sort of help, ed, you know, bring on the next generation after that. Um, you know, what does any, can anyone speak to any strategies for retaining reporters of color, making them feel welcome in the newsroom, not like they're just there to sort of, you know, just be the voice of, of a certain community, but actually integral part of the fabric of a newsroom. And, and again, want to stay, want to maintain and, and, you know, really um, continue that, continue that progress. Um, Let's start, Sarah. Jump in. I can or, jump sure. in. Anybody jump in? Um, you know, a lot of newsrooms like mine had their own reckoning after George Floyd was killed. And um, we spent a lot of time in our newsroom talking and pulling people of color together. And they identified some of the challenges that they saw working here. And um we've been working on solutions to that we have like i think six to eight uh working groups in our newsroom right now and and um one of the most the, the, the most important ones are looking at recruiting and retention and they are sorry my phone's ringing sorry um and they are devising ways that the staff themselves can get involved in hiring and retention and we're recruiting folks from around the newsroom to be part of some culture change in the room reviewing our crime coverage uh, looking at uh, community engagement they're all stepping up to take responsibility for this and to partner um, with us on that and We've got hiring teams and um, career development conversations going on. It's been really a staff led effort. We have a new AME for diversity, diversity and community who's helping to spearhead this, but it's a really staff led effort. And uh, I've been I've just been bowled over by what the staff has done to commit to diversifying this newsroom. Um, and to serving the industry at large and um, working in communities of color in the industry. I, I can jump in as well. I wanted to, you know, echo the staff led um, work because, you know, when I came to NPR News a year ago, it was really inspiring to see members of the staff really kind of taking a leadership role in instituting changes. And change can just be, um, you know, how in, in the culture that exists and how we identify that things should change within culture. And it can be something as simple as 
how someone is received into the organization, right? So um, we have an internal diversity committee that was staff formed and um, they're working on solutions. And I'm sure um, any effort that seeks to disrupt or make change never moves fast enough. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad to see that group of people, but also I see it across the whole staff. Like everyone has an invested interest in making the newsroom a great place to be and work. Um, in terms of like from a managerial perspective, I think one of the main things that I'm passionate about is just practicing equity every day. So yes, it's important to put a focus on the journals of color that come here or that are being recruited or um, applying for positions, but I really want the feedback from the news team um, directly and you know, holding me accountable, holding other managers accountable and really practicing equity. Because if you actually practice equity in its purest form, everyone benefits, right? Um, because you know, everyone has the capacity to succeed and be seen and, um, you know, as it relates to particular tactics, um, you know, having, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one virtual, we've been virtual this, this week, we're voluntarily back to the office, but a lot of the individual tactics are reaching out to people for one-on-one -on -one meetings, small group meetings, um, soliciting feedback, um, being open to change. And I think overarchingly, the pace at which positions are filled is kind of the pain point in our organization because nothing ever moves quickly enough. Um, but there can and should be more efforts around the holistic experience of employees. And I would venture to say, um, not just with the folks on this panel, but across the room, other news leaders that I talked to, I think that is an area where news leadership really has to kind of close that gap so that we're serving our staff just as much as we're serving the public. And so I tried to come not just to individual meetings, but to my conversations with staff to really ask for their feedback and be earnest about it. And and um, and I want people to hold me accountable. If, if we say we're gonna do something, we're gonna do it. And if we're gonna be intentional, we're gonna do that too. But the silver lining for me and the most important thing for me is that we're gonna hire talented journalists. So I don't want to create quotas. I do not want to say we need to hire a person of this background or this um, life experience or this generation. I want us to focus on producing and creating the best journalism every day and creating an environment where people want to be in that space. And I think that's one of the most impactful recruitment tools that you can employ as a manager is really living that um, and walking that walk and creating space for people to be who they are, that they can show up as their own authentic self every day and celebrate that and um, to do the work that's ingrained in the communities. Um, Tracy provided a lot of oversight and detail into where the gaps exist. And that is probably um, also true for the other groups, uh, but certainly for the black community as I, I see that here um, plainly that we all, I think as news organizations can and should do better. I think one of the things with that being said uh, is definitely, uh, Sarah, it's like, you know, being a manager or being in upper management is going to make the, the, the employees, because I think, and I apply to everyone that's taken a step forward to trying to do better on, uh, with the death of George Floyd. I'm sorry it's taken that in, to get to where we're at today. That's, that's, the, that's the sad part for me. However, moving forward, we just got to make sure if we're going to make people comfortable that they see people that look like them in management positions, because bringing on a new writer, as I cited earlier with the Kerner Commission's report, when they were trying to push people to bring in reporters, it didn't change the landscape because the decision makers are the managers or the editors or the people that decide what hits the, cut, the cutting board and what makes it. And if you don't have the right people in the right places to make the right decisions, you're going to have more of the same outcome. And so that I think if you want to make your people comfortable in your newsrooms, they have to look at the management table across the way and see somebody that looks like them. And not everybody that's white and one black person that's their token black. Sorry, I'm just putting it out there. That I'll be sorry. <laughs> that fills a bill for them, but does it fill the bill for the community? And that's the important part. And that's what I want the questions in these bigger newsrooms 
to ask that question. Do we look on, do we look amongst our peers and see enough black editors, enough black representation at that level to where it makes sense? Or communities of color, if it's not black, what other communities do we have that for the communities that we're representing, do we have them communities at the table? Do are they making the decisions? Absolutely. And I was so before I was at North News, I was at Insight News, which is also a historically black uh, publication. And I was at Insight during the killings of both uh, Jamar Clark and Philando Castile. It was the killing this past February of Amir Lott that gave me a sense of perspective of what my brothers and sisters at predominantly white media organizations, how they had a different experience experience than I did. I was insulated. I was going to work among Black people every day, able to verbalize the frustration and angst and of what was happening. Because w once again, yeah, I'm a journalist. That's my profession. But I'm a Black man 24 hours a day. And so I can't take that off. And so I was benefited by being able to be at two different institutions where I could be that person um, authentically in, in my work relationship in coming over to a predominantly, what's considered a predominantly white organization, it took me a minute to realize that everyone processes information differently. And that's not bad, but there's a different experience. And so um, being there, I was able to understand that we have to make sure that we're offering open safe spaces for all of our uh, our, our, all of our team um, the, and, and it's not employees. If we're gonna have a successful newsroom, we gotta have a team. And, and so that we're all a part of this team that we're offer, offering open and safe space to. And that's what um, that realization came to me this, this past February. Yeah, and I just wanna add, you know, I've been uh, in a building mode for the last three years and we made, uh, very intentional to bring in uh, not just diverse candidates and diverse reporters, but also young reporters who can grow with us, who we can mentor and cultivate and give the chance to really um, produce stories uh, that are meaningful. And, you know, when I look at the media landscape in the Twin Cities, I, I see um, leaders who are really trying to make some changes. And since you know the killing of George Floyd, I think both NPR and the Star Tribune have been intentional in um, working on how they frame stories, how they hire, and how they produce stories. And you know, I look at their websites every day, and I see you know real changes in um, uh, very insightful coverage about you know issues that I I care about, and I I would love to cross post on our website. And I think, you know, um, that that requires, you know, that needs some acknowledgement and cognition. And I applaud um, Suki and Sarah for really working on that. Hi, all. So generally, we would allow time for our attendees to submit um, some questions and we would transition over to a Q&A, but it seems like our panelists are actually so in tune with the attendees that they've got into a lot of these questions without even having to read them off. Um, but I am going to allow just a, a moment or two for anyone who may not have had a chance to submit a question, please feel free to submit it down in the Q&A box below. Um, we may be able to get to one or two before we officially close out this session. So I'll just give a moment for that. Um, one other note that I would like to add is I'm going to be dropping a link to our event survey in the chat box that's very helpful um, for us being able to better curate these programs in the future to make sure that we are meeting your needs and having discussions that are of interest to our audience so I'm going to drop that there um, but otherwise I will give you a moment to submit something to the Q&A um, I believe we did have one question we wanted to address Jessica if you wanted to um, introduce that yeah absolutely um, so someone has asked um, do you think some of this disconnect between between outlets is a disconnect in their view of the responsibility of, a, of news? For example, a responsibility to inform versus be a pillar of or service to a community. 
what do you think the mission of news should be or does that differ based on news organizations? So I think maybe the question is, is there tension between who you want to be as a, as a publication, as an institution, and, and is there tension between that and just doing the news, reporting the news as it comes out? Um, anybody want to jump on that? I, th I think Tracy might actually be the best qualified because and if we talked about mail a little bit before this, but when we're talking about being news and being part of community, um, Mel was not only a journalist, but he was unapologetically an activist. So, uh, and, and the spokesman and my former employer Insight, um, that was kind of, that was really part of our mission was to advocate. So I, I think Tracy might be well, well to speak on that. And I certainly will. And so for us, and, and, and yes, Harry, by all means, Mel, his, he, he had two loves. He had the love of being an editor, a community editor, and he had a love and passion of being an activist. What our mission is, is to, to really be more of an informer. So we're not necessarily here to create a side for someone to stand on. So that was a diff, just a little bit of a different model than what Mel's other life was as an activist. So um, although he was definitely, he had his boots to, on the ground and his ear to the ground, and he knew the community very well. Um, when he did his writing, he really had to make sure the best to his ability that he stayed down the middle and really gave the news and information that allowed our readers to make their own informed decisions on things that impacted them and not necessarily from an activist perspective. And I hope that answered that question that the that the participant had. Lovely. I don't want to end prematurely. So if anyone else just has, you know, a couple of final thoughts that they would like to add before we close the session, we're more than welcome to. There was one comment in the uh, chat and I uh hit the answer live button and it went away. So I don't know if that um, uh, was a, an error on my part, but it was dealing with, uh, and I apologize because it was about 40 minutes ago, but it was dealing with being a journalist and interaction with police and, or the backlash uh, that we've seen in the Trump era uh, against journalism. And, and I will answer that I, I mean, and unfortunately, I have this experience. Uh, April 14th will be the anniversary of my arrest as a journalist covering the protests of uh, Dante Wright. And again, as I said earlier, I come to any job, uh, yes, as a journalist by profession, but as a Black man um, by nature. And those two sometimes, those two worlds do sometimes collide. And it, it was very scary in the, the 2016 to 2020 post era of being both black and being a journalist and being uh, a target either way. Um, so, uh, it, it, and then on the other hand, we, we as journalists rely on police for a lot of our information. Many of us have very good police sources. Hell, a lot of us are related to officers or uh, people in prosecution such as myself. So there is this duality that we face, but um, it, it, it can cause for um, uh, a lot of reflection. Uh, that's, that's how I'll put it. All right, and it looks like we are actually now approaching time. We wanna be mindful of um, every Wednesday and schedule. So I wanna thank our panelists um, for this actual excellent and thoughtful conversation. And of course, our moderator, Jessica, I'd like to give a special thank you to McKinsey and Company for its support of today's event and our incredible partners on the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Thank you to our audience for joining us and for your thoughtful questions as well. I know that we had some pretty deep conversation today um, and again, this event has been recorded, so you'll receive an email with the full video of today's event um, in the next few days. We will also post this recording on the ProPublica YouTube channel. So from all of us at ProPublica, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your evening, and we do hope to see you next time. Everybody take care.